So dendro and archaeoseismology. So this could be dendroseismology or dendrochronology. Uh, the dendrochronology would be the more general term of measuring time with tree rings. And then dendroseismology is the specific application to studying earthquakes with tree rings. And then archaeoseismology is studying earthquakes using archaeological records. So I'll define both of them and and provide a couple of examples each. And the the really the main distinction is there's direct effect. So if the earthquake ground rupture goes through a tree or through a structure, that's an obvious direct effect. Or if the earthquake causes uplift or subsidence of that feature. So some uh, villages have been especially drowned by earthquakes because they get pulled down, not by the tsunami, but by the direct displacement of the ground, and um, also trees. So we know in some subduction zones we see uh, drowning of coastal forests. So, and then the indirect effects are from ground shaking, so which is more widely distributed, obviously, and maybe more useful in some ways because uh, maybe we can't find the exact preserved effects along the fault trace, but we can see the effects on some some trees or, or some place. So dendroseismology, application of free ring analysis, earthquake studies has these direct and indirect effects. And the main thing is you have to always look at more than a, one tree so that you can know, okay, maybe just one tree is dying or something's happening. It's a coincidence. But if a group of trees all show the same change in their growth behavior, at a certain time, then we know the bigger environmental effect, which could be an earthquake. So here's an example, and I, I just show a couple of examples. It's not a major emphasis for our presentation, but here's a place along in Alaska near, well, about 250 kilometers from the 1964 Great Alaska Subduction Zone epicenter, but it was a huge earthquake, so it's still in the area of, uh, in kind of in the near field of that earthquake. And so what, what they do, so these are the cores, and you take, they're a little bit exaggerated here. They, they might be about one centimeter in diameter, and they take a drill, and it's like a hollow drill. So you drill in to the tree, and it brings out this little cylinder of the tree as the core. And so it doesn't kill the tree when you take this out. And so then you can study it like you can preserve it, maybe cut it in half, and uh, analyze it. And so you see then the tree rings are these light and dark bands, and usually the light is the kind of rapidly growing uh, wood that's put on each year, and then the dark would be the time when the tree is a little bit more dormant or it's not growing very fast. And so what you can see in each one of these, and obviously, well, I mean, it's not obvious, but the in, the lower part would be the, the inner part of the tree. So the older part is here. And they think this was about 1950, right, where they, they start. And so then you go, and as you go out from the, towards the edge of the tree, you see this real shortening of the ring width in three of these cases. Now, something happened here with this core seven. It doesn't quite show it at the same time, uh, but maybe a little bit. So so each time when they these rings are changed is right at 1964. Here, these are, are more of a quantification of what I just said. So time versus ring width on three of these trees, or four of the trees. Uh, two sides of this tree, and then this master chronology. So this would be the reference that's saying kind of what the environmental changes were, maybe temperature or other things that might be causing changes in ring growth. And what we see is that these trees were really affected right in 1964 by the effects of the earthquake. And so here it's a, they think that that what happened was that the trees were on a beach and the beach shook so much the trees, they didn't get completely killed, but they were leaned over. And it sort of affected their roots. And so they 
they slowed down their living pattern for a little while for uh well you can see almost 10 years before they recovered uh you know i don't let me let's just look quickly at this paper application of tree ring analysis to paleo seismology and cape suckling the seismic shaking was uh it's 240 kilometers from the earthquake epicenter it had, was shaken but it also uplifted by four meters in the earthquake and so that's Sitka spruces, so this is a kind of tree growing on the edge of a beach ridge, and they were tilted slightly southward, so toward the, the ocean. It's right on the, basically a, a beach. And, uh, and then you see they, they cored spruces from nearby that weren't strongly affected by the earthquake for the control chronology. A confident result. So you can see, for example, this paper, these authors are at this tree ring laboratory. So they are real experts of trees and using this method. So, so well, the reason why they're such experts is they are very knowledgeable about the tree botany, you know, how the trees grow and which trees are better and which trees are worse. And then they can apply this method confidently. So I'm not so familiar with. Local earthquake is also fine. So you'll see the next example is from a strike slip fault in earthquake. Because it, it just needs to feel the shaking or be directly affected by it. And one thing that happens with some trees is they're so close to the fault that they, and if it's a very tall tree, it, it snaps. So the bottom goes so fast and it sends the vibration of the tree that the tree top will break. And so this width of the tree uh, can cause a, a strong effect, including the, the tree, they say tree topping. So the top falls off. And so then this was a study that was a part of some work done along the San Andreas Fault. And they saw significant damage to trees near the fault, so within a few kilometers where the ground motions were probably very high, 1G or so. And so the trees were just really damaged. So here again, it's just, uh, go ahead, what the question? It's straight maybe, and tall helps because then it's very sensitive to the shaking, but I think more important is that it's a, a tree that produces good rings. So not every tree grows with annual rings. Some trees are like a palm tree doesn't do doesn't do rings, so this would not work. Oh, that's that's good. That because that means that it has this environmental stress. The tree is stressed by this bending, and so then you should a a response to the bending may be a change in ring ring behavior, ring growth, or it can change around the tree. So you may try one side and try the other. And maybe earlier, it's symmetric, so it's growing the same amount on both sides of the tree. But once it gets bent over, it may be responding, and so only one side really grows, and the other side is stuck. So you could look for asymmetric growth patterns in the tree. So it's the nice thing about dendrochronology is, although in detail it's important to have some colleagues who know about the trees, but it's cheap and easy to try. And you just need to, if you don't want to cut the tree down, you just need a, a tool that can give you these good uh, cores so you can check it. But you can also just cut it down and see what happens. But this is much more destructive, obviously. So good question. So just as an example, here was these trees near the San Andreas Fault. And the, uh, the problem was that they knew there was an earthquake in California in 1812 because uh, – there were some churches there that were damaged, but this is indirect evidence of the earthquake. They didn't know where it had occurred, so they thought it was at the coast. But then they did this detailed work on these trees in the mountains near the San Andreas Fault, and they again show this master chronology that says that there was no major climate variation or something, but these trees near the fault showed this really abrupt 
change in ring growth, like actually the year after the earthquake, there was no growth. You see zero ring ring width. So it just it just was so affected by the earthquake it nothing happened for that year. And then it slowly recovered. And so then they use this to say, well these trees must have been near the source of the earthquake, which means that was in the mountains along the San Andreas Fault and not near the coast. So the churches were obviously affected by the earthquake, but they couldn't pinpoint the source, whereas the trees helped with the source. The index is the control. So they, in in uh, for example, let's look here. Uh, let me just see if we can get a good explanation of the. Uh, yeah. So you see right here the what they write is that two on fault trees located within five kilometers of each other recorded drastic growth reductions, these two that I showed, and both took tens of years to recover. Both trees lost their crowns, so their tops, and then seven other on-fault trees recorded growth reductions. So these nine trees were located on the fault, and then control trees no, showed no such prolonged disturbance. So the control trees are away from the fault, but they're the same kind of tree, and they're the same elevation, same conditions, same uh, climate and weather conditions. So the the master chronology is, is the reference because you could say, well, if every tree in an entire region shows a change in in uh, ring growth, that's maybe a climate change that there was a drought or the opposite. But in this in this case, for reference, they they compare the master chronology with these specific trees on the fault, and they see that they were really affected, say in some kind of a local uh, event, which was in this case the ground shaking. So, Mudrik, you had a question? These were very close. Uh, I think um, within, so they say within or near right wood, so this is, and they say on or near the, well, on and away. So away was for control, but on the fault means within hundreds of meters, I, I think, to a kilometer. So very close. So that's, and we know for big earthquakes that the ground motions are so high that everything's moving and shaking very much. So it, this is uh, basically, you don't see everything this is the handle of a of a drill. And so the drill goes into the tree, but the the center of the drill is hollow. And so as it goes in, then it, it leaves a cylinder of the wood. And then this wood is now coming out. Let's see if there's another picture. Yeah, so it looks like uh here's one. So this you see this drill with the handle? And so it, it, the cylinder cuts around the, the piece. So let's see here, this one. Yeah, it's like a cigarette of wood. So here in Australia, and so you see these guys are they're really using it to climb it. It's a big study purpose. So this is what I mean that it can be quite easy to get these data and start to explore. But uh, then you want to develop a good study so you can make sure that it's not just a coincidence that the tree rings are changing width. So, good question. I should have put this picture in this picture. Yeah. This would be the best thing is find those people, have a meeting with them and say, hey, guys, if, you know, tree rings, they'll not say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know. And then which trees are good in, in let's say, in Java or, or wherever in Indonesia. And then they'll say, okay, this one species is excellent. And then they'll start doing it. It's some geology work, but it's more of a botany, botany, paleoclimate type of studies. You see here they may 
cut the tree in 1981. So this is the day it was, was, or not cut, but drilled. And so the outer part is alive. And so you just count back. One per year, it's, it's unique. But the other thing that they do is sometimes if you have a very long record, is you can try to do a radiocarbon date. But the problem is, you know, the radiocarbon uncertainty can be 20 years. So if you don't know where you are at all, then that can help. But really what they do is then they start to do, they call wiggle matching. So if you have a tree ring profile and then uh, you have other trees from the region that are dated, you can try to match at like a fingerprint where your tree fits best in the record. Well, just think of the shaking. So the tree is shaken so much, one G of acceleration, and it's just going like this for one minute. Just and so it's just injured, it's damaged. And so, for example, these trees were, were tilted. They, they fell and the roots came out of the ground. So they almost were killed by falling over. But they didn't die. But they just were, were really injured. And so this like shows their pain and their recovery. So this one comes from Cascadia. So a subduction zone earthquake well, a subduction zone in Pacific Northwest. So here's the Cascadia subduction zone off of the Northwestern United States. And this one is one we are really worried about because it hasn't had an earthquake for a long time. And for many years, we, we didn't know when the last earthquake was. But starting about 20 years ago, there was a real begin a revolution in understanding about the Cascadia subduction zone. And I'll talk more about this on Monday when we do Cascadia or we do subductions on paleoseismology. But just as one example, they took some trees from some of these places in Washington, so from up here. And here are the, the, the trees and many different trees. So they, they looked at them. But you can see in 1699 to 1700, in many trees, there was a change. But notice how sometimes the, the, the tree, uh, the ring growth is diminished, but other times it's in, increased. And so what they call it, sometimes they call reaction wood, that the response of the tree to injury is actually to grow faster, to kind of recover, or even sometimes the shaking, maybe it helps the tree because it, it gives some new oxygen to the roots or something like that. But in any case, the overall regional mean showed no no change, maybe um, outside of the subduction zone area. But in these trees that were suspected to be in the source region, we see a big effect on them just in 1699 and 1700. And so it's very precise timing. And this was the best timing until they went to Japan and they found some tsunamis, they call orphan tsunamis. So the tsunami had no local source in Japan. So they started thinking and thinking. They realized it was the Cascadia earthquake in 1699, I think it was January 1700, so right in the boundary. And it sent a tsunami across the Pacific. So to me, it's a great, uh, like a detective story, you know, and uh, they found what happened. So archaeal seismology focuses on individual seismic events occurring at precise moments over relatively recent time, meaning the last few thousand years, whose action affected precise locations, human constructions, and their environment, which in turn can be studied through the archaeological record. And so this is from one paper. And so, again, the same thing is, is direct rupture damage or secondary effects like ground shaking or other effects from uh, res kind of indirect responses to the earthquakes. So this is some uh, something from McAlpin in his book that just shows this origin of damage, which is the direct effects from faulting, fissuring, and this geodetic changes might be tilting or uplift and subsidence. And so you see offset of features and also one example of an offset fortress that we studied. And then the second one is ground shaking. So it's 
especially buildings or structures being knocked over or damaged. And then secondary phenomena, so these are, for example, tsunami damage or landsliding, and then other secondary anthropogenic phenomena like inscriptions, recording earthquake deaths, or sometimes myths of the people where they tried to explain what happened by some story, and that goes through, you know, through the families. They tell the children, the children tell their children, and so on. So, so here's one example. This is just one that I know because we work. I worked on it with my colleagues. Is there's this fortress in Kyrgyzstan, so Central Asia, and we were working here and. It's a really interesting place, and at first you see, okay, there's there's the wall, and here's another wall, and now the middle is a cemetery, and it's abandoned. But in the 12th century, in this place, this was a, a certain khanate, so some local kingdom, and they had these, these fortresses. And this is a good example because they, most of the archaeologists, they don't always know about earthquakes. And so many of these <clears throat> fortresses, when they're abandoned, the usual interpretation is, well, it was a war. And so they blame it on, like, Genghis Khan, who came and he killed everyone and, and they left the fortress, abandoned it, right? Um, or it's climate. Somehow the place there was a drought and everyone left. Well, one other source is if there's a huge earthquake that affects the structure itself, maybe everyone just leaves and they go somewhere else. So we call this, this is the draft title, but in the final title we called it Direct Seismogenic Destruction of the Kamenka Medieval Fortress. So, because you see this fault scarp goes right through the fortress. This line here. And so here's a picture. So the you see the fortress wall is offset. And also here. So it's a kind of oblique slip deformation of the fortress. So this is unusual to have the fault be immediately going through the building, but it can happen. There's also a famous case from Israel uh, where there's a crusader fortress. So the crusaders came to uh, the Middle East in, I forget which century, maybe 11 or 12th century also, and they built some castles and fortresses. And then one of the fortresses is right on the Dead Sea Fault, and the earthquake ruptured right through the fortress and offset the walls and different pieces, and again, it was originally interpreted to be damaged because of fighting, but it was just the earthquake, and the geologists, as soon as they worked there, they said, well, see, there's faults going inside the building and out, and so there was no doubt, but the archaeologists weren't trained that way. So, so that's direct effect. Here's the indirect one. Is a ta uh, here's a tower that you see. It, it didn't fall over, but the columns were shaken so much that the elements of the columns were displaced relative to each other. And then this lower one is a, a famous one in Greece, where all the columns did fall. And one argument for this being earthquake and not from a war is they all fell the same direction. Because sometimes if you think, okay, soldiers come and they're, you know, really angry and they're destroying everything, they might be more random. Just, you know, this one goes this way, this one goes that way. But if the earthquake comes and it just always just whoosh, like this, that one first motion, then they're all going to fall this way. Or if the first motion goes like this, they'll all fall that way. So co kind of coherence of the damage is another indicator of possible earthquake damage. But... It's key to remember it's indirect, so we don't know where the earthquake was, but we know it was near enough to cause this deformation. And But we may, especially here, this is in Greece, so maybe people wrote this down. They said, oh, yeah, there was a terrible event. Um, so the uh, this temple, the old temple, right, and look how it's damaged in this earthquake. So what this means, though, is it's very important because the fact that it's a temple, 
that was only damaged now in 2006. It wasn't damaged before. And how old is this temple? When was it built? 700 years ago? 700 AD. And it, so one thing is that it's a good constraint. It appears that there were no earthquakes since or since 700 AD until 2006 because if it was like the earthquake in Jokja in 2006, it would have caused the same damage. It doesn't appear unless they re rebuilt it. They did, okay, so there were fire earthquakes there. So I, I'm not an expert, obviously, in this temple, but the discussion is just that you can use the temples as and their histories as seismograms. So if it's getting hit by an earthquake every now and then and has to be rebuilt, that's important to know. And if it never was hit by an earthquake in the time it was there until, let's say, a recent one, that's also a really useful constraint on the ground motions, not because it was just shaking, not the earthquake. And so here's some more of this one just showing the, the damage, right? So then here's another one that, that Gayatri brought to my attention near Jokja. Maybe you guys have heard of this, but this, this place, Kedulan Temple, what was strange about it that the archaeologists felt was that there were trees growing in the middle of the temple. And so usually if it's an active temple, you wouldn't see trees there, right? So the argument was that maybe it was abandoned because of an earthquake. Everyone ran away. They were afraid. And there was some damage also, right? But then it was covered by Merapi uh, surge deposits. So, uh, but the idea of the archaeologists was that it, that it wasn't abandoned because of the volcanic eruption. It was abandoned before that in time that the trees could grow. And so here's some the rubble at the base of the temple, not related to the lahar, but maybe interpreted by as due to ground motion in the earthquake. So, so this just trying to find some more local examples also because, you know, Indonesia has a nice long historical and archaeological record that if, if it could be understood well might provide some valuable information about the 